Times there. <laughs> What's hey, happening? 103.5 Jack FM. Wait a minute. I was going to say 103.5 Jack FM, but we're in the Bat Cave, apparently. We're in the Bat Cave, brother. Whoa. You know, I, I, this is the hangout. We're hanging out with the Batman. Batman. <laughs> So I, I didn't have anybody doing my makeup tonight, brother, so I, I wanted to hide my face. I was feeling a little awkward. No, that's good. Keep keep it hidden. It looks good like that. Thanks, bro. Singing to my mic. What's going on? We're right here. We're 1035 on Facebook. It is the Hangout, brother. And it's Memorial Day. Happy Memorial Day, everyone. Yeah, Memorial Day. We didn't even realize it when we uh, put the show together, but hey, we're doing it anyhow. Right. We're here. We're, we're live. We're doing it. Yep. So Watch it live or not. Hey, hey. Why so for today, we got some white wine instead of red wine. Hey, I went patriotic, my brother. Patriotic. Yeah. Get Look it straight. That. Straight up patriotic. Now, I can't tell you what's in here. Yeah, I know. It's like water. Because then they wouldn't let me drive home. How you doing, brother? You doing all right? Doing excellent. So uh, let's talk about the coming couple coming up weeks here. Who do we got next week? We've got the endearing, the magical Morgan Miles coming up Morgan Miles, next Monday. country, up-and-coming country artist who has done quite a bit. If you haven't heard of her yet, you will. Right, and we're not even going to pigeonhole her as country. We're just going to say that she's a star, brother. She's yeah, just a star. You know what I'm saying? And then the week after that, who do we have, bro? Uh, Jeremy Popoff from Lit. Anybody love Lit? Lit. Um, 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 um. Yeah. That's yeah, my bedroom he's, music. He's a great guy. He's going to have a lot of really cool stuff to talk about. Yeah. I almost fell out of my chair. You should have fallen out of your chair. Well, it would have made it more interesting. The week, after, the week after that, we've got um, we've got uh, Rage. Rage, yeah. Dale Rajini Raj has directed every music video known to man. He's, ever. Yeah, he's, done, he's done Guns N' Roses. That's what most people want to hear. Guns N' Roses, but I mean, all that remains. I mean, he's done a lot of heavy stuff. The guy is seriously... Done Seriously. a lot of stuff. Yeah, I mean, this, is, this dude knows everybody in the business. If they've got a name, this dude's worked with them, and he's going to have some stories. You're, we're going to be some fun there, man. So let's talk about tonight's show. Yeah, let's do that. We've got Kevin Martin and Adam Curry of Kendall Box. Yeah. That made me fun. Dude, yeah. they, they, these guys are so cool, man. They're laid back. They're chill. And I think we just stop talking and bring him in. What do you think? Let's do that. Let's stop let's, talking and bring them in. Let's knock on their door and let's see what they got here. Knock, knock. Who's there? Kind of box. Hey, hey. hey sideways. <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, what are you long, doing, brother? That was the longest cold I've ever been on. I mean, I was just right there. <laughs> <laughs> there you are. <laughs> Welcome to the right. Hangout, guys. We're live on Facebook via Zoom on 103.5 Jack FM and Man, we are so happy to have you guys. We appreciate you guys for joining us. Oh, thanks very much. Absolutely. So we all are experiencing this fun little lockdown in, in our own little ways. And I see uh, California is a little bit behind Texas. So you guys are, you guys are still pretty <laughs> stringent up there, aren't you? A little, a little bit behind Texas? <laughs> <laughs> Just a little bit. Yeah. Little pool parties going on here like we see over there in Texas, let me tell you. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they're happening. <laughs> I think uh, LA, you know, Los Angeles proper, um, where I'm at, and, you know, we probably won't um, open up fully until like the 4th of July weekend, you know, or, or maybe even a little bit after that. It kind of depends on, on what kind of spike we see over the next couple weeks out here. I mean, Californians are pretty good about, um, you know, following kind of the requests and, and needs of, of, the people and then there's the people that don't want to and i mean you know look everybody's got you know free will and you know, i'm i'm practicing it as much as i can you know I'm, I'm at my friend's house i went swimming today at my friend's house and i played basketball for the last you know 45 minutes with him so you know i have to see if that comes up in two weeks but um no it's, <laughs> we're all pretty good over here right cool. Adam, how you doing, it's been pretty mellow here i was just saying like like i'm sure you know everyone's neighborhood and everyone's situation is different but like where I live, everyone's just being chill about it. Everyone's being extra um, uh, understanding. You know what I mean? Like I haven't seen anybody getting confrontational here. The the most we've had is there there were people out with you know the signs and the flags uh, 
they've been out there, you know, saying, you know, reopen the city and stuff. And honestly, California, the state's kind of reopening. It's uh, LA proper is yeah. uh, extended and stuff. But like uh, last weekend, I went down to Redondo Beach and the lifeguards are back out there. People are on the beach. You can do stuff, but they haven't opened the parking lots. So they're limiting how many people can get down there. You know what I mean? So you can't find a place to park. A lot of people bail. So it's not as crowded as it normally would be, but it's, it's semi-open, but no restaurants yet, no bars, and no music venues. No music venues. Zero. Yeah. It's crazy, man. I mean, we're itching to get some live music back up here. We, we would love to, uh, to get somebody back on the stage. We talk about it constantly, and I, I'm sure it's, it's really a crunch for you guys because that's where you guys make the majority of your money nowadays is, is performing. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and with a you know with a record that was supposed to come out this year, um, you know that was the game plan was to tour on and support it. Um, so this will be um, really the longest time between albums uh, for Candlebox since uh, the, the break between you know ninety eight and two thousand and seven um, with between Happy Pills and Into the Sun. So you know, it, it's going to be kind of strange. Um, I, the guys, you know, we all got on a, a Zoom conference the other day, Adam, myself, Brian, Island, um, Carlos, our sound guy, Sean and Dave, our techs. And, and, you know, I basically had to apologize to them for the fact that they're not going to be working for a year. Um, you know, we are, our first scheduled date um, is actually, I think, March 31st. So, um, you know, wow. it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of really screwing things up, you know, not only for, for the band, but, you know, for our fans and, and that type of thing, you know, it's without a record to support, you know, um, or, or touring to do on it, it's kind of, point, we're not even releasing the record till next year, you know, so, yeah, it's a little wow. strange, uh, wow. you know, and I mean, I'm, I'm applying for all the PPP loans to, you know, hopefully give the guys a little bit of money after their unemployment runs out, because out here, Adam was saying, you know, you can only go to $10,000 on unemployment, um, I don't know what it's like in any other city or, or any other state, but you know, it's, it's difficult out here to live on $10,000. Um, yeah. Right. A year. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's difficult anywhere to live on that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No kidding. <laughs> that's, that's crazy, man. So the new album that you come have coming out, is, is there a name to the album yet or. Yeah. It's next called year? Wolves. Yeah. Wolves. Wolves. Yeah. Nice brother. Nice. So yeah, that's that sucks, man. It didn't come out this year. So you, you brought up Happy Pill. Now, I became a fan of one of your songs because of a an Adam Sandler the Sand, Sandler movie. Oh yeah, with oh, the Water Boy. Water Boy, yeah, Water Boy. That was, that was a great album, actually. So let's go back. Let's let's take it all the way back, dude. Back into ninety, ninety one, ninety two, ninety three, when the Candlebox, um, you broke your self titled debut album, Candlebox, and. And obviously, man, you guys charted, you went gold off your first album. That's unheard of, brother. Uh, well, the first album actually um, was, you know, surprisingly, um, we, I don't, you know, we didn't, we didn't really know one another um, as, as friends. We weren't, we weren't guys that hung out together. So we kind of were thrown together like a boy band. Um, and somehow we were lucky enough to, to write songs that, you know, um, people wanted to hear and you know by the time I think uh, the record came out what was it June 20th of 93 and by March 15th of, of 94 it was gold and then right. uh, come June I think June 15th of, of 94 it went platinum so I mean just a little under a year um, the, the record sold a million copies and, and you know I don't think we knew what we were doing obviously and, and we had no idea that it was going to be that successful um and you know i think interestingly enough it, the follow the following two albums really show how much we didn't know one another um because we i think everybody kind of thought that they were the songwriter in the band and and um you know there, there were failures um and and really kind of unfortunate musical mistakes that the band made on Lucy and Happy Pills, um, which comes from not being a band for 10 years and, you know, and right. playing the circuit. So, uh, you know, we had one really happy accident and then we had a couple tragedies. <laughs> <laughs> 
right? You guys came up in a time when I mean, the music scene completely evolved. I mean, and that happens generation after generation. This is, this is what happens. But you guys were right in the cusp of when it changed. I mean, the Hollywood scene was gone. And then this whole, the Seattle thing just blew up huge. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it was being part of that it had to be, you know, feel pretty special, really. I mean. Well, it was strange because we, we were the youngest guys from all those other bands. And, you know, I mean, you know, when I was 14 years old, Chris Cornell was 21. So that'll give you an idea of like the split in age. And, and it was strange for us because we weren't accepted in the Seattle scene, if you will, by, you know, our, our peers or our fellow musicians. We were kind of, who's the, who are the long haired guys playing blues based rock and roll? You know, um, so it was, it was strange. It was beautiful. The scene was amazing and the music was incredible. And, and, you know, all those artists over the years I've, I've, you know, gotten to know and become friends with. Um, but, you know, really my only connection with any of those musicians um, was the fact that I worked at a shoe store with Soundgarden's manager, Susan Silver. And that's how I met all these bands and, and musicians. We never played any shows with Pearl Jam. Um, we played one festival with Soundgarden. Um, we played one festival with Alice in Chains. I mean, we, we've never toured with them. We were never invited to tour with them. We never opened uh, shows, never invited to open shows. We were supposed to do that whole Metallica tour with Alice in Chains in 94, um, but Lane was in rehab, so that didn't happen. So we took the second spot over Suicidal Tendencies. But, you know, we, as, as incredible as the music was and, and the scene, we weren't part of it. And it, and it kind of sucked for us. And I mean, there's, you know, there are a lot of books out about the scene and there are a lot of band, there are a lot of band members and, and managers and, and people that are interviewed in those books that kind of talk shit about us. So, you know, right. it's not really, um, it's not really a fond memory for me, if you will. Wow. That's not what I expected to hear. That's yeah. yeah. You know, so that's Adam. For you, though, the Seattle scene, I mean, it, it, there was bands like, um, you know, Heart, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, there was another band that was there in and they're still there and they've been around forever but they were the first winner of the battle of the bands on mtv back in 1980 i want to say two or 83 called rail do you remember yeah rail? yeah it's funny because years ago when i was a kid i opened up for them right after that happened they were touring i had a band and we opened for them and then years later they ended up in open open up for a Jack Russell's Great White out in somewhere, I don't know, somewhere in that area. And I was like, oh my God, Rail's opening for us. And of course I had to talk to these guys like, hey, and they've been around. I mean, at that time they were around for 10 years and they're still yeah. a really good band and they're really cool guys. And it was just, it was just interesting. They, they yeah, never yeah. really went, you know, they just kind of, you know. Yeah, Metal Church was the same, the similar thing that happened to them. They were a Seattle band as well. And, and you know, they, they, kind of lost traction when that Hollywood rock and roll glam scene just got snipped. And, um, you know, even though the guys still play, you know, I think they're all kind of, you know, producers and engineers now or something like that. It, it, it's, Seattle's a weird city, man. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm happy to visit it and I'm happy to play shows there, but I'm, I'm, I, I, like I said, I don't really have fond memories of, of being a band from that city at all. That's, that's really, wow. So it hasn't changed change so much up there too. Like Seattle, right. like it, it, it's one of those cities in a way kind of like Nash, Nashville where every time you go there, something's gone, <laughs> something new is there and there's a vibe that, that doesn't exist anymore. It's like, you know, all these clubs and Kevin can speak to more in detail, but there's very few of those clubs from back in those days that are still around that are doing stuff, you know? I mean, I you know, it's, it, it's, it, it's changed so much. Like, like I said, that whole corporate Amazon uh, world has moved into there and they've just kind of taken over. It, was, it, it seems like just in the, the time that I've been going there, um, it, it's, it's gotten a lot more um, gentrified, I guess. And, and it's just, it doesn't have that raw edge that all that stuff came out of. You know, you know it's yeah. interesting because at, at, there was a period here when all everything dropped and the whole LA scene was just gone. Everybody started moving to Seattle. And that's probably really what destroyed what you're talking about. It's because everybody went there and they're trying to, you know, they put on their flannel and they're going to try and be like, you know, instead of being themselves, they were trying to be Kurt Cobain or whatever. You know, they were trying to follow the trend instead of just sticking to whatever it is they loved doing. Yeah. So maybe that's part well, that's, of what ruined it, you know? We, we did, we, we did the, um, 
we did the Rocket magazine, um, which was like the kind of the rag up there for the longest time from, I want to say probably like 79, 80 till probably about 96, 98. Uh, but they did a series on us when we were doing the Lucy record called The Boys with the Most Cake, and they had us dress up like Courtney Love because Courtney Love hated us for some reason, like just <laughs> with, a, with a passion would just talk shit about us. And none of us could figure out why. We, we didn't know what the problem was. So they, Charles Peterson's like, you, you need to dress up like Courtney Love and we're going to put you on the cover of the magazine. And so we all had the blonde wigs and the tiaras and stuff. And, okay. uh, and yeah, and it said Candlebox, the boys with the most cake. And she lost her shit, man. Like, but she accused us for years of, of moving to Seattle um, to, to become a grunge band riding on Kurt, Kurt's coattails. And I was like, well, first of all, we sound nothing like Nirvana. Second of all, the Pete, Barty and Scott were all born here in, in Seattle. Um, and I'm the only one who's a transplant. I moved there in 1984 from Texas. So a little, little bit before the grunge scene had taken off. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was, yeah. it, we, we saw a lot of those, you know, bands that did move there, uh, you know, right around 94, 93, 94, 95, uh, cutting their hair, changing yeah. their sound, but they still had the really amazing Les Paul, you know? <laughs> Right, exactly. Did I remember when I lived up in Seattle? There was this really kick-ass club called Rock Candy. Do you remember yep. that? I used to own it. Did you really? Yeah. Oh. God. I had my twenty-seventh birthday party there, and Brian Johnson sang uh, five ACDC songs with a friend of mine's band for my birthday. That place was awesome. So, did did you play there coming up, or? We our first ever show there. We opened for some friends uh, called Sweetwater who are still a band and we're still really, really great friend, friends with them. They gave us, um, they would sell out shows all over the place and they had been um, a band for quite some time. So people really loved them. Um, and, and they let us open for them at the Rock Candy. And um, that was really the kickstart for us because all their fans, you know, a place held like 1200 people. So right. 1200 people saw us for the very first time. And, and that was a big launch for us. So we ended up taking those guys out on the road with us years later for, a nice arena run just to kind of pay back the favor oh yeah and into what, what i was talking about earlier i think that that spot where the rock candy used to be is now like a courtyard by marriott or something yeah oh, yeah no. seriously it's gone. It's gone. they raised it yeah yeah i, I lost I the property to benaroya i haven't been back to seattle since like 90 and from what i hear it's just you i wouldn't recognize it anymore and that's sad no, yeah, like if you get downtown, is that the Pioneer Square and all that? That's kind of the same. Right, you know, right. But when, when you get up and start heading, like, you know, more towards Capitol Hill and all that stuff, it, it's it's all changed. Amazon and other corporations have they've got the money and they're buying up buildings and yeah. raising them down and building new shit. <laughs> right. So, Adam, when when did you hook up with Kevin? Let's talk about that, brother. When, when did you join the gig? Um, well, I, I started playing with Kevin in uh, what, 2002, 2003, around there. Um, we had a band called the High Watts when uh, you know Candlebox was on hiatus for a little while there. Right. And, uh, we did a bunch of touring, went around the states, went to Europe, um, did some stuff over there. Amazing band, one of the greatest bands I know I've ever been in. But we yeah. just we didn't have a label. We were trying to do it on our own. And at that time, it's kind of funny if if we had done what, what we were doing then now or in the last five years the band probably would have blown up huge but you they, they were still closing the doors to people doing it independently back then it's like no 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 you haven't paid for this radio you haven't done this i always tell people like there's there's a few moments like you know in your life as especially as, as a musician in the entertainment industry where you 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 get realizations of things that you kind of knew but it just it's a very poignant moment and one of them was we had a single out and we were trying to get it on radio stations. And there was a station somewhere in the Florida panhandle. Can't remember if it was Pensacola, Tallahassee. Right. And right. Uh, our song went up and they do the cage matches, right? So you play your song, they play someone else's song. And right. People right. call in and vote. And uh, we won. Every time it went up, we won. We won five in a row and they capped it. If you've won five in a row, your song's retired, right? I mean, I'm talking about we beat Queensryche. We beat an Iron Maiden song. We, I mean, we, and there was one of the nights we got 90% of the votes. Yeah, like, like it was going so good so it finished up and uh our guitar player colin who's kind of handling a lot of the business called up the station and talked to the dj and got a hold of the program director and said hey man you know we uh we just five nights in a row we, we no one could beat us it's going great your listeners love us um 
what can we do? We'd like to come, you know, play like a radio show and we want to see if we, what we can do by getting into rotation on the station. And the program director just said, I'm sorry, we have no room for you here. Yeah, seriously. 100% yeah. wouldn't do it because they were, you know, a clear channel station and we weren't paying. We didn't have a couple hundred thousand dollars to buy into radio. That right. was it. You, you awesome. know, because the program directors and just they miss the boat, you know, that, and that's one of the things that we try to do here is is we promote local talent. You know, it takes I try to take it back to old school, brother, where if yeah. there's a local band and, and they've got a demo out or, or they've cut something, bring it into me, man. If it's airworthy, I'm going to drop it. And, and we'll drop it across every station we've got because that's what radio is supposed to be about, man. Yeah. It's just giving back and making sure people hear the stuff yeah. that they might not normally get to hear. You know what I mean? And, and it's getting back to that, thankfully. You know, I mean, even here in LA, the, um, the, our big, you know, classic rock station here, KLOS, they do local music every morning and they have listeners call in and they vote about it. The program director comes in live in the air and talks about it. And if the right. song gets a good reaction, they put it on the radio. You know, but again, 15 years ago, you couldn't do that. Yeah. You know, they, they just wouldn't let you do it. So, yeah. but anyway, and then when, when Candlebox got back together and, uh, you know, Marty was, uh, came back for the initial tour and uh, he got a law degree, so he had bigger fish to fry. And so then I came in and I've been playing with the band since 2007. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. So we've got a couple questions lining up. We've got one here from Jay Moran and he wants to know, Kevin, um, craziest road story you can think of, brother? That you can actually Metallica. tell. <laughs> Metallica end of tour party at Cheetahs in Atlanta, which I can't talk about. <laughs> <laughs> You're under a gag order, are you? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm, sure it, I'm sure it extends all the way until like 2075. So. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Same, same question for Adam. Adam, you got one for us? You know, I, I don't know if it's, it's necessarily any crazy stories because, you know, like when you're coming up, you, you 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 hear all this stuff and you're expecting it. And and yeah, you see some of those things, but it, it never it, it never you think it's going to be a nonstop thing. And, and those moments are very few and far between for the most part. Right. Um, for me, it's like moments uh, that I've gotten to play with, like people that were my heroes and stuff. I mean, I remember um, years ago, got I, I played a show and we closed out the show. And we had the guitar players hang around from all the bands that day. And this, this, the show started off with um, Uli Roth from the Scorpions and Michael Schenker, um, this band called Stars out of New York, Ronnie Montrose, and then this, the band I was in, we headlined. And I've got sh uh, video and photos of me standing between Michael Schenker and Uli Roth. Who, like when I was like 13, 14 years old, I was listening to those records and thinking, you know, there's no way I'm ever going to get to do this kind of stuff for a living. And here I am standing between these two guys playing a cover of Zeppelin, you know, like yeah. moments like that are really cool. You know? Or so there's so few those. Sorry. I, I said, and you get those every once in a while. And those are great. I was well, going to say, there's those moments where like Adam and I like decide to take mushrooms and play a show in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> I think Robbie had one of those moments with you guys, did didn't you, Robbie? Yeah, there you go. There it is. Look at that. We first, <laughs> there you guys we first are. Met. I was going to ask them if they remember when we first met. They were like, wait a minute. What's that? <laughs> I, I still remember to this day. I still say I'm, I'm so mad because I'm, I'm like the, the pun humor guy. Like, it, it, I love bad jokes. And right. when we took that photo. We took a photo with the, with the whole band. With the, uh, Jack Russell's and great the us. Jack and the box. Jack yeah. threw that one out there. And I was like, I can't believe I didn't think of that one first. <laughs> that's, that's witty for Jack. You know, man. That was a, that was actually a really cool night. I mean, and it, it must have been a little weird for you guys because there's all these well '80s bands, right? And you guys are in there, and you guys won the crowd over. I mean, it was you guys were. It was a great performance. I mean, Thank I'm not you. Sure well, thanks. It, it must have been a little bit weird to be the only band that was kind of out of the genre. And, well, only, know, only only by years though. The band, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's only by years. It's, it's again, it's a blues based rock and roll band, which is why it right. works with all that. And, and really when you get down to it, so is great white, it's a different era, but it's right. still coming from blues based rock, you know? Yeah. So there's, there's that connection. And you guys were amazing that night too. I was pretty blown away. I hadn't heard uh, Jack sing in years. And yeah. I, was, I was blown away with how great his voice sounded. Oh, cool. right on. Band was tight as hell too, man. Good stuff. Right. We, we ended up in one of those situations where we, 
played in Idaho and there was all these bands from the early 2000s and we're like, and I actually pushed Jack into doing the show. I go, let's just do it and let's see what happens because you never know. And it, we, we went over well and all the guys were coming up to him and like, oh man, you're like, they looked at him like he was, you know, Steven Tyler. He was so yeah. excited that they even knew who he was, you know. Right. But yeah. there were all these different bands, like Lit was there, and God, I can't remember, there was so many of them. We were the only band that was like right in the middle of it, and it was like, yeah, let's just go have fun. Don't worry about it. Have fun. If we get booed, we get booed, you know? But if you know, the thing is, if they're good songs and it's a good band, I think that fans are, are open to it, you know? And, and like yeah. you said, the bands that came from those eras, you're right, when they were teenagers, they were listening to Great White. So yeah, Jack is a hero to them, and they know the songs, and they're into it. You know, everyone has their influences. It's crazy yeah, I, how much it would be but i just want to throw this one in there one of the weirdest uh lineups we ever did um we played in in idaho it was a festival and it was us and like sugar ray and um uh, carly ray jepson and Hitler was supposed to be there but that's when their bus crashed remember that they had that bus accident but i mean like every band on that bill no two bands were from the same genre time frame it was it was like the most random names out of a hat lineup I've ever been a part of. Was that Edge Fest by any chance? You know, I don't remember. Oh. I don't remember. <laughs> but it was yeah, it fun. Was a good time. Boise, Boise, Idaho, yeah. Yeah. Boise, Boise Idaho. So, Carly Rae Jepsen, really? Yeah. yeah. Wow. Robbie, I think you ought to tag team with her, brother, and get on a stage. <laughs> she was amazing. She, I mean, I'm She's I'm good. Not she was a phenomenal performer. Phenomenal. I, I feel bad because I had somebody, I had one of her managers reach out to me maybe, I don't know, maybe eight months ago. And he was like, look, she's in Texas. It's only like 2,500 bucks. And I was like, 2,500 bucks to bring her here, you know? But it, wow. I, 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 yeah, I was, I was really kind of disappointed. Discussing that. money on the air. <laughs> <laughs> I'll yeah, say yeah, it, yeah. brother. I'm, I'm not afraid. That's why I'm, I'm with the radio station. I tell you so, what, I, I, I'll say it right now. If you want to hand me personally a check for twenty five hundred bucks, I will come to you. <laughs> I don't know if I'm gonna play anything, but I'll show up. Yeah, yeah just come hang out, brother. <laughs> That's right. But so one of my prized possessions that I've got that I have in my studio is this guitar, and you've got it, right? I'm gonna have to yell at my production team. I'll have to bring it up here in a moment. Send an email to you. Is when you guys did the show up there in Scotts Bluff. And Kevin, you took the time to write the words to Far Behind on the guitar for me. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I remember that. And, that, and that's something I've got hanging on the walls in my studio. And production's supposed to have a picture of it, but they let me down. That's all right. <laughs> I, remember, I remember that well. Yeah, I do that. I do that occasionally like when people ask me to sign guitars. You know, I, I got it from Johnny Cash. He used to do it. And, um, and I, I always ask people what their favorite lyrics are, you know, and what songs. Uh, it's difficult when they say, you know, far away or, you know, um, left behind or you now maybe. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I know it's probably just because they're, there you go. Look at that. There it is. They're maybe just a little bit nervous about, you know, meeting, meeting us or the band or, or myself or whatever. But, you know, right. it's one of those things. It's, it's, it, you know, I, I'm proud of the lyrics that I write. And, um, and, and if people want to, you know, take the time to ask me to sign something and, and they want me to write something. Or I, a lot of people ask me to, you know, hand write out lyrics for tattoos that they like to put on themselves, so which I just did. Uh, I just did one the other day for um, sometimes, sometimes we care more weight than we own, you know, and I like that. I feel, I feel honored to do it. And, and it's a pleasure. It's, it's, it's but um, yeah, I, I took that from Johnny Cash. That's so cool. You know, so many people now, and I've, I've been part of probably 300 concerts promoting and you meet some of them, Robbie. I got to tell you, and you know this for a fact. These guys are some of the most humble, easy to work with, just very, very sincere about their craft. And it was a pleasure having you guys up there. So, for people that don't know or, or haven't been to one of your shows, man, they got to go. They got to go when when we can. Thank you. Thanks. Now I got to send you a check for twenty five hundred bucks. I know, right? <laughs> I thought we discussed this off air, brother. <laughs> So Robbie, tell me what it was like playing with him, brother. It was cool. I mean, it was good. And I mean, you saw me, I crashed their photo shoot. <laughs> it was like, who's the photo bomber? Hey, I'm jumping running in there. <laughs> it's a good time. But, well, everyone in their band's good too. It's like, you know, I, I know Dan, their bass player. We, we see each other on the scene out here doing jam nights and stuff like, I find 
and I think Jack's done the same thing, and I know Kevin's in the same boat. It's like when you've done this for a little while, you want to be around people you like to get along with. You don't want to have to have unnecessary bullshit and drama because the, the job itself will bring it to you. You know what I mean? You'll get enough stuff from the outside, but you want to know that the guys you play with are a group of friends. You can all count on each other. You don't have to worry about somebody's trying to do something Super to undermine. Important. Like everyone's all rowing in the same direction, you know, like we all get it. Like, you know, we, we love playing and we want to do a great job at it because we want to continue to do it, you know? Right. Absolutely, brother. Absolutely. It, we we got to tell people that all the time. Yeah. It's not about it's not about the talent. There's guys who can play the part, but you've got to be able to get along with them. If you can't get along with somebody in a bus, you don't want to get you know you want to yeah. get on stage with them. Yeah. You know, if, if you don't trust them, I mean, it, you've got to have guys you get along with. It's so important. Yeah. yeah. So we got a question from Brenda Preston for Kevin, wanting to know: Was blues the major influence behind you, and is that the direction you were trying to go when you when you broke free? Well, I was never, I was never really a singer in a rock band. Um, I got stuck with this job, like reluctant lead singer, really. Um, I had been asked to sing on some demos by a friend of mine um, who was my former guitar player, this guy named Rick Vaughn. Uh, and I was like, well, I was playing, and I was playing drums in a punk band at the time. Um, so I was kind of like, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm not really a singer. And he's like, well, I've heard you sing. I've been to parties, I've heard you sing. Like, just come in and give it a go. Um, so that kind of became my job. Um, I, I, my main influence is Otis Redding. Uh, that's, that's as a singer who I, I love to listen to and who I think of when I'm in the studio working on lyrics and melody and, and songs. It's like, how would Otis Redding approach this? I've always found his approach to be uh, very rhythmic and, and soulful. And I, I kind of have that you know, timber to my voice. So I, I need to, you know, I need to kind of stay within my, I guess, um, wheelhouse, if you will. Um, right. Would I like to sound like Brian Ferry? Absolutely 100,000%. Would I like to sound like, um, you know, uh, um, Paul Rogers? 100,000%. But I don't. I sound like me. And um, so I guess that lends itself to that blues world. And I love the blues. I mean, I love I love Led Zeppelin. I love Willie Dixon. The reason the album is called Wolves, uh, and and uh, some of the songs on the on the record are um, we have one that actually wrote with Peter Cornell, Chris's brother, which is called Let Me Down Easy. Is it's about this record's really about who we become as a society, and and the negative energy and the negative. Um, and hatred and anger and frustration and like no one cares about anybody anymore and it's almost like we're we're just this pack that's just out to devour one another or or devour something and we're not working together towards something which is interesting because when a wolf pack is working towards something they work well together but when they're the lone wolf um, they're very dangerous and I think that that's kind of what this record's about, and this song, Let Me Down Easy, was inspired by Robert Johnson's Crossroads um, uh, in the element of, of you, um, I'm a sinner, we're all sinners, we're gonna do these things, and we're, we know that it's not going to be an easy road to accept that when, if you do end up at the pearly gates, um, what you're gonna answer for if you believe in that sort of thing, I'm fairly certain that I'm going straight downstairs. Um, and. Uh, <laughs> So the, the, the point of the song is, you know, I understand I'm going there, just let me down easy. Don't, you know, don't make it a difficult uh, transition to that um, fire and brimstone, if you will, so. Right. Wow. I don't think you're going there. I don't know you that well, but I don't think you're going there. You're, you're good. <laughs> you know what I was thinking, wolves, you said wolves, what I was really thinking was, you know, if they throw you to the wolves, you came back leading the pack, mother effers. <laughs> oh, I like that. I'll have to put that in the shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Rob, you might want to trademark that right away, yeah. brother. <laughs> yeah, you know, there's a couple of songs in there, man. Right? So, same question for Adam. Influences coming up. What what genre did you really kind of see yourself doing? And is it the genre that you're in? Uh, yeah, I, I think so, more or less. I mean, you know, my influences were all over the map. You know, I, I gained a lot from, you know, my dad had an amazing, diverse record collection. Um, when I was a kid and he had everything from, you know, rock music to classical stuff, to jazz, to 
um, you know, all over the map. I mean, the Beatles, like from my earliest memories was a huge influence to me. And, you know, I mean, them uh, as an entire band and the way they wrote still resonates to me. McCartney is a bass player. If you want to get to the specific instrument, it was right. incredible with the stuff that he did. Um, you know, I mean, of course, I mean, it sounds kind of cliche, but you know, I'm still a Zeppelin guy. I, I loved what they did. Look, you know, I know that they kind of borrowed a lot of the things, the songs they wrote, but it wasn't about that. It was, it was, they all, they all hit a vibe and they hit an approach and they hit an emotion and they played together with such power and authority and they made a sound that nobody else could do. Yeah. Anybody could do those blues songs. Anybody could do these things. But nobody's going to have the weight that they did. So I was impressed with that, you know, coming up. I mean, Pink Floyd was a huge band, you know. But, I mean, it, it evolved into everything, you know. And then as it went on, you know, there were all these great bands that broke out in the 80s. You know, you, you, had, your, you had your new punk thing. You had your new wave of British metal. You had the actual metal metal, like, you know, that came out of here. And then you, you go back in the R&B stuff, you know. You, you have all those great bands from the, especially in the 70s. I mean, you know, funk and R&B bands in the 70s as a bass player, I mean, Earth, Wind, and Fire, you know? Right. I mean, look at all the stuff, you know, that, that Nile Rodgers was involved with, you know, all yeah. those bands, they were the ghost band for so many of those great hits. And when you sit back and listen to it, man, that groove in that pocket is there. So that's what inspires me. I, I love, um, I'm very fortunate, you know, when we go in to do a record, we do it live. You know, we, we, you know, Dave and I would, when we play and the, the bed guitars, what you hear on the record was played together at that time. We don't piece it together. Very rarely do we punch, you know, like we, we you know what I'm saying? It's like, you just want to find people that you can, you can find that musical uh, um, same level of understanding. You know, you're all, you, you get what the picture is and there's very few words spoken. You know, I mean, I, again, I've been working with Kevin for 15 years. I think there's maybe been three or four times he's asked me to change what I'm doing. Yeah. Because I I listen. I know what's going on. And he has me here because he knows I listen. Same thing with Dave. Same thing with everyone that we bring in. Because if you're, if you're constantly having to um, flay someone into a thing, it's going to get frustrating and it's not going to be fun. And, and then the end result, you're not going to hear that, you know. I mean, you listen to those Zeppelin records. I mean, you can just hear that that thing that bottom laid down he had that thing you know so absolutely raw. so raw and they would play it just the way i mean even you know jimmy playing at a at a time or at a tune or it's like how, yeah. how do you do that yeah um, how do you do that and it sounds great yeah yeah there's certain guys that say you know there, there's an old adage you know that came out with the jazz guys and they, they always called them those are the cats man and yeah. it's like do you know why they call them the cats because they always land on their feet Ah, that's the thing. It's like you, know, you, you can you can push things out. You can you can stretch out and play things that you're not used to. You can go into a different riff, and you're really not sure how you're coming out of it. You know, and and that's the thing I love. It's like when you're playing with you know with great musicians, great drummers. I mean, you know, Dave and I we do that all the time. Where Dave, he he hears something, he's very reactive, and he'll play something new, and he'll play past the one of the fill. So you know, he's kind of like left you hanging. But you know what he's going to do. He's not going to lose his time. So you just have to find your own thing and just trust each other that you're going to land in the right spot at some point. So, so going back to the Beatles, so wow. you, you guys got onto a, a tribute album to John Lennon, didn't you? The Working Class Hero? Yeah, my, my old manager, Lindy Getz, put that together. Um, he's raising money for um, his wife was the woman who decided that you had to use Dawn dishwashing detergent after that, um, the oil rig accident in uh, Alaska. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. So she's the one who said, why don't you use Dawn dishwashing detergent? So she did it and he was like, oh my God, this is a great thing. We need to, you know, raise money for it. So uh, that tribute album was because I think Yoko was involved somehow um, because of John's catalog uh, in being in, in, in relation with, with his wife, Kristen or whatever it was working on the project. And it was uh, Lindy's idea. And um, we did Working Class Hero. Um, I wanted to do um, uh, Wheels. I'm just so like watching the wheels go round and round because I, I really love the melody. Um, but Lindy felt like um, Working Class Hero was good for us because it was a, a song that pokes fun at John at, at Paul McCartney. Um, you know, you, you've got your New York walk and your, your New York talk. Um, and he's, he's basically just talking shit. And Lindy kind of thought that we were 
the band that should be doing that at that point on the record, which, I mean, I, I love the song. I've never played it. Um, I think we played it on the Lucy tour a couple times. Um, it's very intricate, um, it really crazy changes and turns around, turnarounds, and there's a, uh, you know, kind of an acapella part to it. Um, and there's, it's very loose. So it's not something that I would, you know, venture to try and start playing again. Uh, but it was a great tribute. There were some great bands on there. I didn't even know if you could find that anywhere anymore, but um, some really magical songs on that, on that record. And we were happy. We recorded it at Bad Animals in Seattle where we were doing the Lucy record as well. So. Wow. How cool is that to be able to pay tribute to one of the icons and the founding fathers of rock and roll, you know? It was pretty incredible, you know, and I remember we, we, we the guys, especially Scott and Barty, because the, the rhythm of the song is so one, two, one, two. Scott's not that drummer. You know, Scott's very much being, you know, and Barty is a one, two bass player. So they, I mean, they beat one another up for about, you know, 45 minutes to an hour trying to figure that fucking song out. Um, right. And uh, because, you know, you really, you're going in, you're going in kind of cold with a song you know, but you, you've never played it. So you want it to feel like your band paying on, uh, you know, a, a great homage to a brilliant icon. And so you want to do your best, but when you can't figure it out, it's, it's incredibly frustrating, which is, you know, where it goes back to what, um, what Adam was saying as well, is when you trust your drummer uh, to, to take you there, um, it makes it easy. And, and there was a lot of like, with Candlebox, when we made Lucy and, and Hatfields, like I said earlier, it was so much kind of ego and confusion. And because we didn't know one another, those idiosyncrasies kind of started to find their way in. You know, we had these stupid arguments and fights that just, you know, for some reason, and it's probably why Barty's an attorney now, we you know, could continue on and on and on and on and not really go anywhere. And um, it made it very frustrating. But uh, the end result of that song was pretty impressive. And, and, and I, if I, you know, do say so myself, I think we did a great job with it. And, um, and, I, and, I, and I've had people tell me over the years that that's one of their favorite versions of, of that song ever so i you know i guess we did it right i i was very pleased with very happy with how we had, had uh, recorded it i'm gonna have to see if i can find a version of that so i can i can play it tomorrow morning and see what people say about it because I, I i haven't had the chance maybe to spotify it. you know maybe spotify I, I i honestly don't know i don't have it right wow that's crazy man i i i couldn't imagine the pressure of playing a lennon song on an album paying tribute to Lyndon, I, I'd, I'd crack. There's no well, way. And his voice was 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 so specific and and real. And, and you know, and now it's my like every sound guy I ever have. I'm like, I want a slapback. I need I need a slapback that you have to have that in front of house because I love I love that element of the Beatles. I love that element of, of what George Martin did. But really, the way Lennon's voice sounds in a microphone, you know, to try and emulate that on record as a singer um, was was very, very challenging. And, and I felt enormous pressure to try and do my very best with it. So John always used a slap back then when, when they performed or? Yeah, most of the time. Wow. Yeah. That's wicked cool. Robbie, have you ever, have you guys ever used anything like that? Well, I mean, I'm just singing back in vocal in the band, so I don't pay attention to what my voice sounds like other than <laughs> he, but I mean, if I'm, you know, mix, because I do mix some of our, our music, I mean, it's not really the sound for Jack. Yeah. I mean, it's just, you know, but, um, you know, I'm always open to whoever I'm working with, whatever it is, if it, whatever works for them, you know, you, you do what you're supposed to do. You don't go out and, you know, do something crazy out here. I mean, for... You know, for Jack, I, I probably wouldn't do that. I could try and go, hey, what do you think of this? And, and he could say, you know, yeah, hey, that is cool. Or no, what are you doing? Yeah. Right. yeah. And, and I think it's also a lot of times, like for, for John Lennon, that became his go-to. But I think just yeah. generally, a lot of things are song specific, you know? Yeah. You know, right. This particular song can use this treatment or whatever. It's exactly it's kind of, it's kind of like the old adage of the, uh, the old sculptor that says, you know, the piece is in the stone. It's my job to get it out. <laughs> right. right. So let, let's go back to that debut al at the album Candlebox, Kevin. 
you, you, you had to have been grinding for a while and perfecting your craft and then all of a sudden it just blows up. Man, I, how does that affect somebody? How, how do you deal with that level of success right out the gate? I mean, it must have turned your life upside down, brother. Yeah, I mean, um, it was weird. You know, I, I, I didn't, I, went, I started college and then I dropped out of college. So I really had nothing to fall back on. And it was probably, you know, um, the stupidest thing ever to, to not finish college. But, you know, I, I think that you, you, if you're lucky enough to have the success we had, hopefully you're lucky enough to have family members or someone close to you that can kind of keep you grounded, help you direct your investments and your money and, and you know, keep an eye on things and, um, and, and not be stupid. Um, I guess for me, I didn't, I never really, like I said, I never really considered myself um, a lead singer. So I, I, I kind of, I didn't become like this, you know, rock star with my shirt unbuttoned all the way to my belly and, you know, wearing crazy hats and stuff like that. I just kind of was that dude who was a punk rock kid that got a job singing in a band. And, and, and I tried to keep, you know, as, as relatively grounded as I could. I, I you know, I, I bought a Porsche. Um, which I think every rock star is supposed to do. Um, <laughs> but um, I just kind of, you know, I, I was, I bought a very humble house in Seattle and, and I, I kind of lived my life um, comfortably and, and, and I never got, and Seattle was cool back, you know, back in 94, 95, 96, you know, you could still kind of go around and, and people weren't going to, you know, kind of get in your way or bother you about anything. Like I went to see a lot of shows, you know, I still, I did that on my time off. Um, I did, a, I was a builder before I became a, a musician. So I, I helped Christopher Thorne from Blind Melon build his studio in his house, which was two blocks from my house. So I would walk over there and I, I helped him build a studio, you know? So I, I did those things. I rebuilt my kitchen and you know, I did those things that kind of, I remember, you know, doing before I became a musician. So it kind of kept me grounded. You know, I, I can't say the same for, you know, Barty, Pete and Scott. I don't really remember how they lived their, you know, their lives. But, you know, there's there's something strange that when you go to the cash machine to take money out, and you see, you know, several numbers that you've never seen before. Um, and, and then you realize, oh, I can go buy a Porsche. Um, <laughs> and and then, you know, but that's it's all fleeting. If you don't really have a foundation or you're not grounded as, as a human being and you don't have a good family or or friends around you, you know, you end up being becoming very destructive and self-destructive. And I was lucky enough to have, you know, a great family and great friends and great foundation. And I'm, I'm still here. You know, I, I never became a drug addict. I, drug addict. I, 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 um, I drink like a fish, but you know, I can, I can manage that to the way I need to manage it. Um, you, you know, I, I guess I just, um, I never really bought into the whole rock star kind of thing, I guess. Right. That's good. I mean, you see it with so many people because they think it's always going to be there. And yeah. I won't even name names, but there's quite a few of them out there who have, you know, had their success. And then, they, you know, they don't have the money anymore because they don't realize, like what you said, you know, that foundation to be able to, you know, it, it, you know and then not have people around you ripping you off, too. That happens. Yeah, all the time. A lot. All the time. So that's good. It's great to hear. You know, I'm curious though, before all this happened, so you were playing drums in bands before all this? You were a drummer. Yeah, I started, I started as a drummer. Uh, I, I picked up the drums when I was like 10. Um, and I did that up until I was 19. I joined Cannabox when I was 20. But we were called Uncle Duke and then changed the name to Cannabox um, shortly after that. But yeah, so I, I, I still, you know, sit down when I can at Soundcheck or I had a band for a while. I played with um, these girls. Um, they asked me to play drums for them, which was fun as shit because they were terrible. But I, you know, I enjoy them, and I love them. All. They're, they're the sweetest girls ever. And we actually had a lot of fun making music. Um, but they were still learning their instruments. So for me, it was kind of you know, I was kind of the 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 grandfather saying, "Okay, come on, you can do it. This is how you do this," you know, sort of thing. So maybe it was an, an ego stroke for myself, but. But yeah, when I have a chance, I, I still will sit down with a kit. And like I mentioned earlier, when I approach 
singing, it's always based on the rhythm. It's always based on the one and a two and or the inside or the three. You know, I always move around within that rhythm, finding that way to to make a, a, a lyric feel as though it's a part of that rhythm of the song rather than just the strength of the melody alone. Yeah, I think that's what makes Dave Grohl so good because yeah, really guitar wise, everything. He's a great drummer and he, he it just makes his stuff. He just knows how to make his rhythms and it, vocally and guitar wise, just really good. So he's got he's got you, great percussive with his with his playing exactly, and guitar. Exactly. Were you the drummer in the band to start? No. Okay. Okay. I wasn't sure because you said when Candlebox started, I was like, wait a minute, were you playing drums at first? No, so you were a vocalist from the get-go of Candlebox. Yeah, Rick Rick had uh, brought Scott in. Um, I had met Scott a couple of years earlier, but we'd never, Scott was playing in a band called Stry, Sky Cries Mary. He was also, I think, in Myth or Realms, Adam, which was it with with Jeff Tate. Was it Myth or Realms? Um, no, I know Kelly was in that band with, with Jeff, but I don't, I didn't so know. Then, so then Scott was in the other one. So yeah. Mercado played the other metal band that was opposite what Jeff Tate was doing with Kelly Gray. Um, so Scott and Rick had known one another a long time and they were starting this thing. And Rick had, had, um, I had met him at a couple parties and he asked me to come sing on some stuff. And at the time I was, I was really a super fan of, of what Chris uh, Robinson was doing with, with Black Crows too. I really thought, you know, his style and, and his approach as a lyricist and singer was interesting. So I was like, I'll give it a go, you know? Cool. Wow. So 94, of course, we, we tried to relive Woodstock. And I hear, uh, I hear you might have some stories for us for, from that. Well, Woodstock was, we weren't supposed to do it. Um, we were on tour with Metallica. They had only scheduled the Friday or the Saturday and Sunday for Woodstock. Um, but because those tickets had sold so fast, they decided to add Friday. And I think they added kind of the more alternative um, of, of the rock and roll that was happening at the time. So they put us and Collective Soul was, um, live, Violet Femmes, um, Seven Mary Three, I think maybe Seven Mary Three, a couple, couple of different kind of, rock bands on the main stage for that Friday night show. Um, and we were right before the Violet Femmes. So we went on 11 and the Violet Femmes closed the night out at 1230. Um, and yeah, I mean, it was quite the experience. They wouldn't let you on stage to watch other bands because they wanted you to experience. So the stage rotated. So we were setting up as I believe uh, live was right before us or collective souls before us. I can't remember. Um, and so you, you could hear the crowd, but the enormity of it, but you couldn't see it. And um, it was uh, mind bendingly loud. And when that stage turned and you saw 300,000 people, it was, you know, I mean, I was touring with Metallic at the time, so I was playing in front of 50, 60,000. Um, but I had never seen 300,000 people in one place. And, um, and, it, and you know, it's, it just goes on and on and on. It's like a crazy wave. And the experience was, it was really beautiful. And then the next day um, I got to, I knew um, Henry Rollins' um, monitor guy. And we were about to do um, Europe with Henry Rollins. So I, I could talk to him into bringing me up on stage so I could watch Rollins. And, um, and saw the Green Day um, mud slinging thing, which was hilarious. And um, it was a real... It was a pretty amazing experience, but we had come, we had to be there by Friday and we had finished a show with Metallica on Wednesday night in Kansas City. So we had to get from Kansas City to whatever that town was in New York, essentially in 24 hours, really, because we had to be there the morning of Friday. So um, I think we flew out a, a second driver um, to take over for our bus driver midway through and, and just drove. It was long as shit, man. And, and um, but the experience was something I'll never forget. And, and uh, you know, 45 minutes is a great way to let people know who you are. And, um, and that kind of really propelled the band um, with, with great success um, from that moment on for the debut album. So there was no way you were going to, you had to be there, but probably because there's no way you were getting in there if you didn't get there at that time is what you're saying. Exactly. There's too many people. There's no chance of getting into the venue unless you had a helicopter. I think we arrived on where the bus is parked. I want to say we arrived Friday morning at like 4.30 a.m., 5 a.m., something like that. Wow. And then, then you get press all day and then you play your show. So it was, it was yeah, it was a little bit mind-bending. 
Incredible. I think our producer has a uh, question for you, Kevin, from one of the followers here. Let's see what she has to say here real quick. Hey, Dub, are you there? Turn your microphone on, Dub. Unmute yourself, dear. We'll come back to A-Dub. <laughs> Nothing's coming out. <laughs> there, I'll, un I'll unmute her, see if that works. Ah, it didn't work. There we go. All right. Sure. So we've got somebody that has a burning question, do we? Yes, we have one for Kevin and one for Adam from the same person, Veronica from Minnesota. Hi, Veronica. She wants, she wants to know, Kevin, what is your favorite song to sing? And Adam, what is your favorite song to play? Ooh. Veronica. Uh, <laughs> I song to sing. Kevin, oh. yeah. There you oh, are. Get that one over. <laughs> I love, uh, I love, um, I love singing um, a lot of Candlebox songs. Um, my favorite one uh, is this new song we're doing called um, "Nothing Left to Lose," which comes out on the record next year. Uh, and then um, probably you from the debut album, and I really, really enjoy doing sometimes um, from Happy Bills. But there, I mean, it's hard to pick, you know, a, a real true favorite of ours. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm kind of in the same boat. I mean, we're, we're very fortunate at, at the, the set list that we bring out every night. I mean, there's really not anything on it that I look at and go, eh, you know what I mean? Like, they're all great songs. They're fun. You know, we, we can... In, if there's ever anything that we feel like, you know, we're not getting the, the reaction from a crowd, we have so many others we can switch into. Um, I mean, just for a straight out rocker, I mean, Arrow is always a good one because no matter what's going on, Arrow does what it does every single night. I mean, so does obviously you and Far Behind, you know, but those are easy answers because, you know, I mean, those right. are the ones we're waiting for. But um, yeah, it, Kevin's right, nothing left to lose, a new one, that's, that's sneaking up there on, on Arrow with that, just that sheer energy level. Um, you know, I mean, it, it, there's, again, there's so many great songs, you know, I mean, I love the ones that have the energy. We slow down, we have some interest, intricacy. There's songs like, um, like, uh, uh, the more mellow ones like Lover or Breathe Me In, which those are fun because every night you don't know exactly what you're going to get out of them because there's so much, especially in Breathe Me In, there's such an improv at the front of it. And I'll be honest, there's some nights we just don't do that well. You know, and then there's other nights where it's like, man, we really nailed that. So there's a real genuine sense of excitement, you know, when you've, when you've caught a vibe. But to me, it's less about the specific songs and it's really about what is the energy that happens in that room. And because I, I, I contradict myself and I, I don't play for the fans. When I'm playing, I'm playing for me and my band. Like, you know, I'm up there with that vibe, but I'm not oblivious to fans. And when they feel what we're doing and they react, there, that's the greatest feeling in the world because now you've done what you do and you've gotten that reaction. And like I said, wh wherever we get that energy from the crowd, that that's what I'm looking for. The songs I all love. I'm not worried about that. <laughs> so we've got one last question for the night and it's coming from Mike. Go ahead. The correct answer is all of them. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> well, yeah, basically, it, it really yeah. is. You know, right. We're, we're very fortunate. We got, six coming on seven albums to pull from if we can't get a good 15 to 20 songs out of that then we've done something wrong <laughs> right so michael fernandez has the last question of the evening guys and it is have you ever suffered from stage fright and how did you deal with it i, I suffer from it almost every night i get super nervous before i go on stage um i i you know it's a lot of liquid courage um that starts at sound check um you know, um, I remember the writers. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's thing, you know, you, as a musician, you never really, and being a singer, man, it's like I know that when we go to play shows next year, that this band is going to have to rehearse for two weeks prior to it because, and it's not even for them; it's for me to warm this up again because this will be the longest that I've gone without singing um, on stage in twenty seven years really i mean even when i wasn't touring with candlebox in 2000 to 2006 i had the high watch with adam i was doing other stuff and i was going out and playing shows i mean this is going to be one year without 
almost one year without singing. Well, actually probably one year because we, the last year we had was like February 29th. Right. Um, so, um, you know, that's one thing that concerns me. Uh, you know, I'm a 50, 51 year old man and, and, I, and I don't sing soft rock. I sing, you know, I'm up there and I, and I sing really loud. Um, right. Matter of fact, when we do <laughs> in the middle of uh, um, Sweet Summertime, we do, uh, she, uh, what is it, Adam, the Guns N' Roses song? Uh, Sweet Child of Mine. Child of Mine, yeah. And, we, and we're doing it a full ha step and a half up from Guns N' Roses. So, wow. What? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Because yeah. we're doing it, we do it at standard tuning. Huh. Yeah, and and our our songs is a full step up from that anyway, so it's a step yeah. and a half. Yeah. So, wow. so like, I I I am an idiot, but um, <laughs> the veins popping. <laughs> yeah. So I do I do I do every in a sound check. Like if I feel something weird, I'm like, God, what the fuck's going on? You know? Yeah. I mean, it goes through my mind every, every single every single show. It's the, and it is the toughest thing people don't realize the toughest job is the singers is the toughest because oh, yeah. you go through all these different climates and you know, guitar playing, you can be sick and whatever, you know, but singing, man, every little thing, every little thing can affect the voice and it's yeah. super yeah. difficult. Yeah. And it, and it's actually a good sign though, that you get nervous. I mean, I still get nervous. It, it's just kind of brings a sense of urgency. It, it shows that you care. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I do. Yeah. I like to say I don't, but I do. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, clearly you do if you get nervous. If you didn't, you, eh, whatever, you know, but. Whatever, yeah. I mean, some people can do it. I see some guys who seem really relaxed. I'm like, wow, how do you do that? I can't, I can't. I'm just like, but once you start singing, you're probably good. Once you go, okay, everything's working. You're out there. Probably the first song, you're like, everything's working. Probably good. Yeah, yeah until, until I fuck up the lyrics and then I stop the song and go, we got to start that over. <laughs> <laughs> or say, hey, Denver, and you're actually in Cincinnati. <laughs> <laughs> That's Houston, Dallas. Whoops. Yes. Yeah. Did oh, you? That was a good one. Oh, yeah. No way. You did not do that, did you? You're from Texas, brother. I was drunk. I've been drinking tequila for seven hours. Oh, tequila man. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I like tequila. <laughs> we, we, we drink a lot of things. We don't discriminate. Yeah, they're right. The writer. I'm keeping it light tonight with some wine, but normally it's tequila. <laughs> if I'm gonna drink, I'm not much of a drinker, but when I do, I love good tequila. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, gentlemen, our time is running short here on Zoom, and I, I really want to say thank you so much for joining us and, and being part of this hangout. Um, we're really trying to put this out there and just let people know who people are. And, in a very non interviewee way. So I, I thank you for joining us, man. Very much. Oh, our pleasure. Yeah. Absolutely. So much, man. Really good. We got to keep this whole thing going. Well, nobody can tour, man. Got to get all connect and talk and keep that fire burning, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Really good. I think we all learned a lot and I learned something new about the cat that was very good. Thank you. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I never knew it. I came <laughs> on their feet forever. Now I'm like, oh, ding, ding. Light bulb goes on. Very yeah. good. <laughs> <laughs> Right on, brothers. Well, much love and respect. We'll keep turning you here on Jack FM, and we appreciate you for joining us. You got it. Take Thank care, you guys. guys. Appreciate you. See ya. All right. So we got. Uh, that was awesome. That was beautiful. Beautiful. I learned. I learned a lot. I learned a lot. It was good. They're great guys, man. Yeah, they are. They're really cool. And there's, there's just a, you know, there was, uh, there are just, you know, things I didn't expect, you know didn't expect you know certain things I'm like wow you learn you learn something new so. yeah because I, I I would have pictured that they had a, a little bit more of a camaraderie uh, with the scene back then that's what I was totally expecting that whole yeah. camaraderie that there wasn't there for them it was like wow it's kind of a little shocking and it's crazy because they came out of there in such a great way and they burst onto the scene man going platinum with their first you know debut album and to know that they didn't have that connection with the Seattle scene was was actually kind of good. Uh, <laughs> I, I kind of appreciated it. You know what I mean? Because it, it good. and they're it definitely just, worth seeing. I can tell you. You know, when we played with them, they were. It was good. I mean, I want. I went out front and watched them play. You right. Know, it was like, it was cool. And then it was after the show that picture you put up that they were doing photos backstage, and we right. did our band photos. They. They were doing theirs and I jumped in on it. And then I guess at some point we but got both the whole bands together, I think. I guess that's, I 
that's what they were saying so that they must be right. I, for some reason, don't remember that. I just remember photobombing them. <laughs> <laughs> we had our bass player at the time, Chris. I was like, here, take my phone. Take some pictures. I'm running in there. Right. And they were all super cool with it. So, and that just shows you what kind of guys they are. You know, I, I put them together for a show up in Scotts Bluff, Nebraska, I, I don't know, five, four or five years ago. And I put them on the stage with Fuel. Obviously, Candlebox was headlining the show. And and I, I'm not going to lie, man. I'm not going to play the game. I I knew some of their songs. I knew some of their work. You know, being in radio, I played a lot of it. But I'd never really given them a lot of attention at that point in time. And then when we put them on stage, I sat back 